welcome to The Truth in This Art. Thank you for tuning into my conversations at the intersection of arts, culture, and community. I am your host, Rob Lee. Today, I am thrilled to welcome my next guest, a dedicated advocate for social change and youth empowerment. Uh, with a background in nonprofit management and a passion for storytelling, he's been instrumental in fostering community growth and amplifying marginalized voices throughout the DMV, Baltimore, Washington, D.C. He's a Washington, D.C. native. Please welcome James Watkins. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. It's an honor. Thanks, Rob. Absolutely. You know, it's a kinship, man. We both bald brothers, you know, got the beard yeah. and all that, you know, just... no. And we got the same last name. That's... Yeah, that, that, that's that's true, you know. <laughs> I'm here. I'm here. And um, and that's the thing, like, um, as we, we start off, like, you know, definitely trying to like highlight it and and it's been a while since I've done sort of the to peel the onion back for folks to do the um the introduction like straight in. Usually it's just welcome to the podcast and then in post, I do all the editing. And I'm like, no, no, let's do it this way. Let's do it this way. It's that, it's that comfort thing. It's like, you're a comforting guy, Jimmy. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I try to be, man. I try to be a people's person. That's what they tell me. Yeah. No, no, this is all front. This is a facade here. Um, <laughs> so again, thank you for, for making the time. And before we, you know, what, what's the, name a type of dive when it comes to swimming. You know, it's like a swan dive. Is it, you know, before we swan dive into the larger questions, I want to give you the space to introduce yourself in your own words. Obviously, there's a lot of power in it. You know, there's sort of the online joint. Sometimes they fall a little short. Sometimes right. they look too. So for you, introduce yourself to the fine folks at audience. All right. So uh, James Watkins, uh, some people call me Jimmy Watts. Uh, we can get into that a little bit. Um, just kind of the story and the history behind that. Um Native Washingtonian, born and raised in Southeast DC. Um, was a schoolboy. Um, always loved music, always loved writing, telling stories, and that just kind of just transformed into my career today. Um, I'm an arts educator. Um, yeah, just a creator. And uh, just my some of my friends would call me a hip hop historian. Don't know if I would go that far, but you know. I dabble in that. So you, you, you I, dabble, you dabble in the, the hip hop. Yeah. You Notice I put the in front of hip hop, right? Because uh, hip hop, yeah. It's a lifestyle, it's a culture. Age is befallen me. So I make everything the like the Facebook going back to the uh, <laughs> and, and thank you for that. And you know, it's you know, those those are the things that I again, you know, the hip hop thing wasn't sitting there in the bios that I'm reading through. The right. sort of like the Jimmy Wads. I, I saw that in a few different places, but and, you know, we'll dive into it. Yeah. But um so let's let's go back a little bit. So, you know, obviously, you know, this podcast has an East Coast focus. It has a, you know, I don't go to other places, but it's the East Coast focus, definitely Baltimore concentrated and definitely DMV. And I've been okay. branched out into DC. So could you share a bit about sort of your upbringing as a native Washingtonian and, and how that's influenced your creative path? Yeah, for sure. So like I said, I was born and raised in Southeast DC. So um, I grew up in the Congress Heights neighborhood, Congress Park. Uh, which is War 8 uh, for my D.C. folks. Um, they I, I split time between that and Oxon Hill because my mom, my mom used to work 13, 14 hour shifts. She worked two jobs. Um, she was a single mom. Uh, so I stayed in Congress Park with my grandmother. My grandmother had an apartment. Everyone knew Miss Mary. She was a staple in the neighborhood. So I had a little nepotism because of it, because it was just like, don't mess with little James. They used to call me Buddha. My nickname was Buddha because when I was a baby, I looked like you know, the Buddha. Um, and I got a picture that I could share with you. But um, just growing up, um, I, I didn't. I, I will say in hindsight, I didn't know how unique my upbringing was. And I say that because, you know, it was just stuff like just listening to go go music every night. You know, uh, I remember just getting in the car with my mom and my grandparents and at nine o'clock that, you know, they play the last hip hop song and then they play go go. So every night you end in the night with a party, um, just our, our slang, the type of food that we eat, the way we spoke, the way we interact with some of the places that we went to. I didn't know how unique it was until I started going to school, um, you know, in Maine and Massachusetts and meeting people all over the country. Right. Yeah. And then they were just so different. And they looked at me as different. You know, they made fun of my accent. They made fun of the way I dress or some of the things that I would say. And I just thought that that's how everybody spoke. I thought everyone knew about go-go music. I thought everyone knew about our culture. So um, it took me coming home 
to really embrace mm. uh, that culture. Cause at first I kind of just took it for granted cause it was just something that I just knew I grew up in it. So after I graduated from college, um, I took more of a concerted effort to learn more about the culture and embrace it because it was just really unique for me. And that kind of, you know, it spilled over into my creativity, you know? So I would have people that would say, is there people that really live in DC? They just thought of it as like a works town, as yeah. a works town. People just come to DC to work for the government and then they go back home in Maryland or Virginia or yeah. wherever they are from. And I was like, no, I actually grew up in DC. And then, you know, when I was watching just different TV shows, different movies and everything was based in DC, everything was the Congress space. Everything was politics, you know, the house of cars, any movie that, you know, is set in D.C. or has like a scene in D.C., they show you the Capitol. Um, and I was like, that just wasn't really my experience. Mm -hmm. You know, it was at times when we do like field trips and stuff like that. But I never really spent time downtown or explored the National Mall. So we had so much culture and, and just so much character. I just felt like we needed to tell these stories um, because people didn't know that those sides exist, it, it existed. Um, and once I started working with youth, I, you know, I really started to see how much evolved DC culture was through the next generation. Right. And it was just something that wasn't really um, brought to the mainstream. And that kind of um, inspired me to tell stories for the people by the people that are from DC. Um, so it's like, whether it was music or TV or writing, anything like that, it was always just that DC focus um, because DC is a character in itself. And it has been, has such a rich history that I don't think a lot of people know about. Thank you. I mean, so, so in being around, you know, within the community and kind of, kind of having this sort of, uh, I guess I'll call it a matured appreciation for it. Sometimes you leave, you come back. Sometimes you see things in a different perspective. Um, I, I, I relate in that, you know, when I was younger, when I was growing up, you know, projects, he's Baltimore gang, gang, gang. Uh, yeah. You know, we had club music, we had all these different things. I was like, yo, I ain't with none of this. I don't know <laughs> what this is about. And you know, I didn't leave the, the the state. I didn't leave the city. I ended up going to Morgan. And I just remember it was funny. Um, it was a DC guy there. It was in one of my classes. And he had like the powerful accent. So I was like, you ain't from here, bro. Where are you from? <laughs> and he was just, he'd ask me, he's like, yeah, where are you from, bro? I don't hear the accent. And I get, I still get that to this day. You don't have the Baltimore accent. And so ultimately the point is he had asked me, he's like, yeah, where are you from? And I was like, yeah, I'm from here. And I started just naming different parts of Baltimore. He was scene checking me as a person yeah. outside of the city, right? Yeah. And he was like, oh, you lived in all the drug spots. And I was like, wow. <laughs> I was like, this is what we're doing. I was like, certified, uh, you know. And it, it, it's it's sort of a piece of it. And I think yeah. going to, one of the things you, you touched on, sort of the, again, I'll, I'll use my own terms, the shortcutting of it all of, oh, if you're filming something in D.C., you got to show the Capitol. It can be a stock photo of the Capitol. Yeah, it's right. DC. It's just like you shot this in Miami or wherever, yeah. right? And the same thing happens here. You know, we'll see, you know, something that looks sort of like kind of wild. We might see like the harbor. We might see, I don't know, maybe maybe different parts of the city. But an example would be this: uh, Meteor Man mm. movie shot in Baltimore. It was said it was DC. Mm. So that's mm -hmm. the that's that's the thing. That's the connection yeah. point right here. Yeah, man. Yeah, I just didn't see any of you know. Like I said earlier, we would go to the museums for field trips. We would go, you know, visit the National Mall. But you know, those things weren't really impressive to us. You know, growing up east of the river, you know, those things we see it every day. You know, I literally see the Capitol every day. So when my friends from college and when they come down and visit they'll be like, oh my God, we got to see what's going on downtown. Or, or they'll see the monument. E even my girlfriend, you know, she's from uh, uh, Virginia. So when she comes to visit, she'll be like, oh my God, this is so cool, the monument. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah sure. You know, <laughs> you know and, that, and that goes into, you know, taking it for granted. Not because you don't appreciate it, not because you don't think it's cool or it, it is uh, significant in any way. It's just you're so accustomed to it. You're used to it, mm -hmm. you know, and it took me to travel a little bit for school to realize oh no i i'm actually from a special place and i need to start acting like it right yeah. so yeah give the places flowers and um i'll, yeah. I'll say 
and doing these interviews, um, being able to appreciate the different pockets of, of Baltimore, even in a, in a much bigger way. Like I've, you know, as an Adele, I, I get, you know, bad of an adversarial and very protective of, of Baltimore. And right. I'm looking for pieces of that from a, like, there's a deeper story. So, right. you know, when I go to, when I go to Philly, when I go to DC, it's sort of that. And I think in some ways that's how me and you got connected and sort of fostered right. that. I was like, all right, this is a real DC dude. It's not like, yeah, I moved in from California and go Nats or something. <laughs> you were just like, nah, I'm, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, I hear the accent. You just out here. Yeah, yeah, you know. <laughs> Tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Yeah. Um, so I got this, this next question, cause I want to talk a bit more about, um, sort of your career in, in, in these areas that are of passion and, and, and super interest for you. We have, um, I see queen bees, um, sounds like, yeah. you know, amazing, amazing where we talked about it briefly when we met up in person and I saw, you know, a bit of the work and, um, the research that I did. Can you share like sort of you know, what that was about and as he fostering creativity, empowering like young girls, but speak on that a bit and share like any interesting story that really illustrates that work. Yeah, for sure. So I want to backtrack a little bit. So how I even got started working with youth, um, I went to college and I, w I went to college in Maine. Uh, so if you want to talk about that, we can, but I spent four years in Maine. Shout out to Bates College. <laughs> I know a couple of my my fellow Batesy is going to listen to this. Um, I did music. I did radio for two and a half years. I also DJ parties and I had did my own music. I was a credit behind uh, my senior year. I had rarely failed a class, but I had failed this one class my freshman year. So I was a credit behind and my senior, I did my senior thesis on the generational thread between the black arts movement and hip hop. And I argue that hip hop had a social responsibility to foster change. Chuck D had this quote that hip hop is the CNN of the ghetto. So when I had approached it, the, the concept to my thesis advisor, he was like, you, you have to do this. And he was an older white man and he was excited about it. So he started telling me about the black arts movement and different uh, artists to look into. And I'm sharing him different artists like rap artists and their socially conscious music. So we did that. And then my last semester, he said, well, James, I know you're a credit behind. How about you do an independent study and you teach essentially your senior thesis uh, oh. to uh, kids in Lewiston, uh, in Lewiston, Maine? My first reaction was, no, I hate kids. I ain't working with them. <laughs> yeah. me, that's me as well. <laughs> Yeah, I was like, no, absolutely not. And he was just like, so you're not going to graduate on time because you don't like working with kids? And I was like, all right, I'll do it. So I did it and I, it it transformed me. Like I, I hate cliches, but it really did transform me to the point where when I graduated, a couple of those kids actually showed up to my graduation and they were on the side cheering me on. And one girl drew me a picture that I still have to this day. Mind you, I graduated in 2012. I still have it. And when I went home, I said, I have to do something. If I had such an impact on these kids, who I don't think I didn't think at the time shared any relation with me. You know, it was a mix of Somali kids and also white kids. And I had a parent, a, a white parent come to me and say, I had to meet this Jimmy guy in person because every Monday my daughter is talking about Jimmy, 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 who is Jimmy? Yeah. So I went home. I just said, I have to do this and work with kids. And I was, you know, bouncing from job to job for about three years. And then I finally found an organization and they was working on um, a Queen Bees, which was a music program. And it was kind of a, a start. It was it was totally different from what the programs the organization had going on at that time. They had environmental programs and things of that nature. So just to do a music, a hip hop program, in that it didn't fit, but if it was right up my alley because that was something I did, I was working on my own music, and me and the girls just click. You know, they write their own music. I I come in with the beat, I come up with the concept, so I might come up with like a hook idea, and then they do their workshops and write the lyrics themselves. We go to a professional recording studio. They knock out the song. I then take that song, go to my engineer. We'll mix the song, send it to the girls. They super excited. And then we shoot a music video for it. Nice. So they talked about issues such as uh, domestic violence, suicide prevention, financial literacy, 
um, anti-drugs, gun violence. We did that for about four years. Um, and one of the stories that really resonated with me, um, one of my kids, I call them my girls, like to, to this day, they still my kids. And a lot of them are grown now. One of them is like 25. <laughs> so the oldest, I think is 27. I've been working with her since she was like, I don't know, 16. Yeah. But um, one of my students was going through a mental health crisis um, over over the summer. And it had got to the point where I was really worried about her. And that was the first time I had met her mom and I had sat her mom down and I was really cool with the family. And we talked about just ways that we can help her. And I remember one day we were in the office and I asked her, you know, what do you think about doing a song about suicide prevention? And I'll never forget, I went to the studio, I had called an Uber to the studio to mix another song that they did. And me and the Uber driver, we were just talking and she revealed that her dad had died from suicide. And that right there was like, okay. That's the song that we need to do. So I had broached the topic to the group, told them what we were going to do. Uh, a couple of them was a little resistant because they didn't share that experience. But for the older girls in the group who kind of struggle with mental health a little bit, um, they were open for to doing it. They just didn't know how to express themselves and how to, you know, talk about encouraging things you know, for people that are dealing with that. And we just had a lot of honest conversations and the, in our workshops. And when it came time to writing the song, they knocked it out the ballpark. They killed it. It's called Lifeguard, if anyone is interested in looking it up. Um, and I remember we filmed that video at Great Falls Park in Virginia, and they were calling for rain, like 60% rain. Yeah. And I was just like, damn, you gonna rain on the video shoot outside? That's why I hate doing videos outside. Yeah. And it, it never rained, but it was cloudy the whole day. So if you look at the video, it's cloudy. And we shot that video at like nine in the morning. So it fit the theme. Yeah. You know, I know you're drowning, but I can be your lifeguard. You know, those were some of the lyrics. And it was just a perfect day. And um, that that song, one of the girls came back to me and said, when I'm down and I'm feeling depressed, I go back to that song. And the truth of the matter is I do it too. I did it. I was struggling with my mental health and I would regularly play that song to get me out of a funk. So it just speaks to the power of music. And these are teenage girls that are doing that, you know, so that that's probably like my my biggest highlight working with them. Wow. Thank you. And we'll, we'll add the uh, song to the show notes. To put it out. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and thank you. Because that's you know, it's a lot having that trajectory and then having a sort of an, an, an impact on folks' lives and, you know, kind of growing up in some ways with them. Like you started mentioning like, you know, like, yeah, and it's like, that's not too far off of your age, my guy. So let's. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, yeah. And, you know, having that sort of same experience, well, as far as coming into it, it's like, man, I don't like kids, kids, why? And now kind of doing it. And I, I'll say like, you know, it's been a few times where I've been caught saying like, man, so my kids, right? And I was like, ooh, ooh, nah. <laughs> but, but then it's yeah. like, you know, we 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 have to change the way we have these conversations about about topics. So I gave I gave the uh, students a, a prompt. I was like, you know, here's any topic you guys want to talk about, really ideate on it, think about it for like the first 20 minutes, and we're going to go down to the studio and record and the topics were in that vein of sort of um, mental health, sort of um, abortion was it was a topic, uh, you know, right. um, and uh, even like consent were topics. And, you know, I started thinking about, you know, when I was probably their age, just they're 17 and, and thinking like, all right, well, to what degree were we talking about this, let alone in this sort of capacity right. and at this sort of informed way? That means like this is on folks' minds. Uh, right. Folks are a bit more mature and, and having dialogues around it. And, you know, it, it was cool. And it was it was done in a sort of fictional way of you're interviewing someone from, let's say, Planned Parenthood, for instance, and right. then having like a cogent conversation around it. I was like, right. Man, these kids are, are, are deep. And uh, I'll say this before I move into this next question. The thing that clicks is when, you know, you're up there, you're not sure if, if it's working. You try to give strategy, you try to give like direction. And when you see that light bulb go off, yeah, like oh man, that, it's delicious. Yeah, like it's like uh, you know, flats and drums and mambo something. No, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll say I'll say this real quick, and then we can move on to the next topic. You know, I 
that was the thing for me. I, we were never trying to create the next pop sensation. We were never trying to exploit their talent. We weren't even looking for students who necessarily had talent, so to speak, or wanted to rap. It was just creative expression. Your voice matters. You have a story to tell. And when you frame it like that and say, just speak from the heart, we'll worry about the the how to how to you know count a bar in a metronome and how yeah. to say things like that all of the rap technical stuff let me worry about that just say what's on your heart yeah and then we come together we collaborate we make something special and it's something that the kids can take ownership in i never look at it like oh you know this is a, a win for for jimmy or this is a win for the organization or this is a win for the kids because these kids will forget my name before they ever forget that experience 100 percent so that, that's what matters to me. So it's it's the reps too, you know, like when you know I talk to my students and I definitely re relate in it. It's just like, yeah, I'm just some guy that you'll see here doing this class and so on. Right. I was like, I'm part of your day. I'm I'm a small part of your week, but a small and a, even a, and even a small part of your day. But you know, ultimately I'm trying to transcend the idea of I'm showing you how to record a podcast. There's not much to it or what have you. There's an artistry to it, but there's not much to the actual doing that piece. And right. um, I was like, what I'm trying to get across to you all is articulating your ideas, sharing your ideas. Yeah. This is a way of doing it. I was like, you know, you guys are going into film, you're going into theater, you're not going into this. This is right. potentially an avenue, but look at me like the person that's going to fund your project. Look at right. me like the person that's a potential collaborator. And that's when those bulbs start going off. It's like, oh, these are crossover skills. These are transferable skills. And to your point, I don't look yeah. at it like it's a, it's a win for the for the Smoke Daddy Rob Lee. That's what I call myself. Yeah. And <laughs> that's, that's actually on my my placard, my, my badge at work says uh, smoke, smoke Daddy Rob Lee. Oh, can I say this real quick? Because and we got to switch topic because I can talk about this for hours on end. But I, I was just thinking about an, another quick story. <laughs> is I had a, I had a student. She she was like ten at this point. We had did a, a women's conference, and um, the girls were invited. And essentially, like the kids do workshops throughout the day, and they can facilitate the workshops. So our students was they excuse me they were facilitating a, a mini studio session. So people would come into the room and they would record a song on the spot. One of my kids ventured off, met two ladies from an, another organization. She walks back into the room with them and they're wearing blazers and they look like they're about their business. I'm thinking she's in trouble. So I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> and she was like, Mr. Jimmy, I wanted to introduce you to these people. And they was like, yeah, they had, you know, she had great things to say about you. We just wanted to exchange our business information and give you our business card. Make a long story short, she was the reason why I ended up traveling to Nebraska and Cincinnati to do workshops for students at their schools. So oh, wow. I ended up traveling to Nebraska. And then a week after that, I went to Cincinnati, did a three day workshop. First day you work with the students to make up the song. The second day you uh, record the song and the third day you film the video. And one of those videos actually was premiered the following year at the South by Southwest Education Conference. So that would have never happened without my 10 year old student. And wow. she probably doesn't even know the impact that she had. I traveled because of her. That's dope. It's it's dope with the way those connections happen. And um, yeah, it's you know, I asked this question on occasion about those chance occurrences, and that's an example of one that you're like, I wasn't expecting that. Oh wow, I'm in Nebraska, I'm in Cincinnati eating this chili, this <laughs> this mediocre chili. Yeah. No shots, you know, go Ravens. I don't know what to tell you. Uh all right, so I would I want to switch gears a little bit. Um and and I think, you know, so there are all these these different things that kind of guide and, and drive us in the directions that we're going to pursue, whether it be professional, whether it be creative. Um, and then there's always that sweet spot when you intersect. So mm -hmm. what are those three fundamental truths, truth in this art, three fundamental truths that have guided you throughout your, your, your journey? Like, you know, whether it be from your advocacy work, your nonprofit work, your, your artistic endeavors, what are those three things that are, like have to be true for you to move forward? I think the first thing is um, integrity. You know, you want to do things for the right reasons. Um, I've passed on opportunities when I felt like um, it was exploiting children or exploiting child trauma or black trauma. Right. Uh, so just having integrity in what you do. Um, ownership is really big for me. 
um, making sure that the people that I work with, even at my current job, that they know that this is about them. You know, I work for a grant making organization now and we do public programming. So I'm not working with you um, at the moment, but it's like you working with adults that are doing work in the humanities. We're saying like, no, these are your events. We're just here to support. We yeah. want you to feel like this is a celebrational platform for you to share all of the work that you've been doing you know, um, for whatever topic it is that you're researching. Um, so I definitely say just ownership is really big for me. Um, and another one, my mom always told me that if you don't do something from the heart, then don't do it at all. You know, when you do something from the heart, you go above and beyond. And I was one of the very first jobs I had post-college, um, this man gave me a book. He was impressed with me. To this day, I still don't know what I said or did for him to take a liking to me. But he asked for my address, and then he sent me a book in the mail. It's uh, Seth Godin called Lynchpin. It's about going above and beyond in the workplace. Yeah. And that book has always resonated with me because one of the crucial elements in that book was you go above and beyond, not because you want personal satisfaction from it, but you do it because you want the organization or you want the project to really thrive. You know, and a linchpin is nothing more than just this small little gear in a machine that you don't notice it. But once you remove it, the whole thing falls apart. So when I had took that approach and adapted that ideology into my work, I got a lot of opportunities from it, um, which enabled me to to do great work in the yeah. city. So I, I think those are the three three truths that I stand by. That's great. That's that's, that's amazing. And uh, the linchpin thing, I definitely will will check that out because. You know, I'm definitely I'm definitely one of those guys who's like I'm I'm looking for the system way of doing things. How can I optimize it? But yeah. my thing is, um, and I came to this this realization years and years and years ago, and it's not a word. I think it's not a word. Uh, I want it to be inexpendable. It's like I want you know, yeah, and, and whether it's like yo, I need to make this thing so specific to how I do it. That they need me to train the next person that's going to replace me. Exactly. Very much sort of my process and knowing what works and being able to explain it and all of that stuff because you want to be able to cross train and help folks. But you know, when you ever run into someone, and I, I would imagine you're kind of that that person. You ever run into someone that's just so good at their job and they're not like, yo, I just like doing what I do and I'm doing it very well. Right. It rubs off. It, it's it's like when you're on a team. You know. It's yeah. just, all right, this dude is in the gym, extra hours, and I'm over here in the cheesesteak line or whatever. And it's like, yo, you should go in there and put up some shots. You get that cheesesteak, but you should put some right. shots too. Yeah, put up your reps. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we, it, it's it's a balance too, where, you know, I do a lot in in doing this, um, doing, doing a lot of interviews and having to figure out like, all right, what's the governor? And I need to have a self-imposed governor mm -hmm. of, all right, Shouldn't be doing 300 episodes a year. Should probably do considerably less. And, but, but, but then when people ask me, why do you do that? Almost like it's a negative. I was like, because I enjoy it, because I enjoy right. what I do creatively. I enjoy my work. And I think it's doing, I hope it's doing some, some good. And right. those to me are important. Those are to me and align with my values. And we, we, we're always looking for, especially I think now, ways to, do less. It's not even work smarter. It's just like work less. And yeah. it's just like, yo, you can still find ways, creative ways. You know, I think that's the thing. Cause like all creative folks, I think are um, problem solvers. Yeah. And I think what the problem is like, look, I got 10 hours to work and I got seven hours to do it creatively. How am I going to make this problem work out? Mm -hmm. So with that, that is a, that is a, a hand-fisted segue into this next question. So peeling the onion back, what secret trait or what secret or trait do you believe that most creative people share that contributes to the ability to innovate, to inspire, to, you know, to make their to make their creative work? I think all creatives are a little bit off. <laughs> Go on. Like, <laughs> I, I do. I, I think we're all a little crazy <laughs> you know and we have a little type a you know it's we have such a unique process in creating 
just be open to being inspired, I think, is how creatives really excel when they don't shut their minds off to anything that they're not really familiar with or accustomed to. You know, one of the things that I learned early when I was working with an engineer is um, a lot of the stuff that I was writing, it was sounding like early J. Cole or like early Kendrick, because I was, you know, when J. Cole came out, he was talking about college and I was in college and I just resonated <laughs> with that. And I was like, finally, somebody can speak to my experience, you know? So I thought I was J. Cole. And then when Kendrick came out, I was like, oh man, I'm like him too. <laughs> One of my, my engineer at the time asked me, he said, when you try to get inspired, do you listen to, what mm -hmm. do you listen to? I'm mm -hmm. like, I listen to what? <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, nah, you need to try listening to stuff that you're not trying to create. Mm -hmm. So he was putting me on to like um, different alternative rock. Um, I'll never forget. He put me on to this group called Aqualung. Mm -hmm. And I just thought the name was just fire. And he played some of the music and I was like, oh, this is actually bumping. I like it. Um, so it's, you know, it was just being open to to listening to different things that I wasn't necessarily trying to create. So then when I go back into that creative space, I feel like this refresh energy. I'm not having writer's block anymore because I'm not trying to create the next J. Cole song. You know, so I think we all just kind of a little off. And I, and I mean that in the most endearing way, because it's yeah. just like the creative process. I'm also interested in like when I look at all of these great people that's creating, like people that I admire, you know, the Issa Rae's, the Shonda Rhimes, the Jay-Z's, the Kendrick Lamar's, the Jeezy's. I'm a huge Jeezy fan. Yeah. I think about um, I'm also interested in learning about the creative process in creating insecure mm -hmm. or creating the blueprint more so than the actual product itself. Because I know it's interesting. You know how they shoot like the behind the scenes videos, yeah. like the making of this album or the making of this show. I watch that all the time because it's just weird. I, I'll, I'll tell you this, like one of the things like I, I, you know, always as a, as a straight male guy of the, the time frame in which I grew up, I was like annoyed by Beyonce for a while. I was like, to the left, how dare you? I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> that was my energy for a long time. And but I've always respected her and respected the hustle, respected the artistry, respected the business, and all of that stuff. And yeah. I flipped. It, it, this is the thing that my girl calls it, my partner calls it um, a contrarian spiral. She was like, mm -hmm. I like when you like have a real specific take on a person, and then they do something that you really admire, and you're like, I'll die for them. They're amazing. <laughs> and it, 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 it happened when I went to see um, A Star is Born, the Bradley Cooper one. That's when Whoa. she first pointed That's it out. Cool. She was like, so hold on. You don't like Bradley Cooper, but you are him from uh, Silver Linings Playbook. I was like, go on. And she was like, and you went to the premiere of the movie that he directed, Sings, and you have a thug tear when his character pieces out. Yeah. I was like, I right, let's let's not even talk about this. So the same right. thing with Beyonce. And in 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 more so because, you know, it was um went to see you know Renaissance last year, and um you know went went out of town for it, went to went to Detroit for it, and I, I was gobsmacked. I was in awe. I was like, I know this is going to be a lit show. I know it's going to be a fire show. And I was like, yeah, it's going to be fine. It's going to be a few things. I was like, no, I'm I'm here. I'm here for all of it. The yeah. whole thing just works super effectively. And I was like, that's a show. Everything yeah. else is on. Everything else is the numerator for that being the denominator. You know? That's the standard. And, and 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 with it, this is the thing that ties in with what you were saying, the sort of the behind the scenes, the thinking. So you remember in the concert when they're showing like sort of the like the screen in the background, all of this different stuff that's happening, like they shot a movie. I was like, I want to yeah. see that. That's yeah. the thing I'm interested in. What was happening in those conversations? Right. And that's what I try to point at at times. And, you know, sometimes I, sometimes are better than others, but try to point at in these podcasts, you, know, you talk to people who do work and, you know, it's creative work or the like. And yeah. I was like, I, I care about the process. You've talked about the process before. I want to know the thinking that goes into you. Right. It's the mindset that you're in. Right. Yeah. I Real quick, back to Queen Bees. I got a lot of Queen Bees stories. So we had... <laughs> There was a song that we did about the female right to vote. Yeah. And it was called Clark Kent. The hook is, um, it was encouraging people to vote. It was like, I come out the booth, I feel like Superman. Whoosh. Now, mind you, I did not come up with the whoosh. I had this, I had this concept 
And I was playing it for, I had wrote this concept for one of the girls who raps like really fast. Yeah. But she missed that session. So I gave it to somebody else and they were in the back seat and we were on our way to the studio and I'm reciting for them. And I'm always nervous because if it's one thing about these kids, they are super honest. Like <laughs> if it's trash, they're going to say, Jimmy, that's not it, chief. Like they're going to say it's not <laughs> it. So I'm like nervous, like reciting this for this 13 year old. And when I say, and I come out the booth for like Superman and she's in the back, she say, whoosh. Yeah. Yeah. Keep that. When you get to the studio, you're going to say that. She was like, really? I'm just playing. And that was the best part of the song. And how I even came up with that concept, the person who was running Queen Bees at the time, she kept saying, Jimmy, do you have a hook? Do you have a hook? And I'm like, ah, yeah, I got it. I'll come, I'll come up with it. And I never had the hook. So like the Friday before the studio session, I spent all day watching Marvel movies. And at the time, I wasn't at the time, I wasn't a Marvel fan. I am now. Yeah. But at the time, I was just, it was like a marathon. So I'm just watching it. And then something was just like, hmm, what if I use Superman as a metaphor, even though Superman is DC? Yeah. That's how it came up. I think I was watching the Captain America movie. And then it, the, the concept just hit me. So that morning, going to the studio, I had wrote it real fast. And then I met up with the girls and we said it. And that became like a huge record. Like the girls love that song. And I love it too. And it was just, you know, watching Marvel. I mean, also it has that that collabor- collaborative thing that's that's in it. Like, I like when... You know, you just kind of see just people like kind of messing around a little bit. Like, yeah. You know, when we talk about like someone's like first album, when you even mentioned like, you know, the blueprint, the blueprint will have you. And it, the, you remember that song? Maybe it's on a blueprint too, but I'm, I'm forgetting which one it's on, but the song called The Bounce. Oh, yeah. Yeah, with Kanye. yeah. Yeah. And then you don't know that's him. And I'm like, right. Yo, who's this other <laughs> dude on here? Or, or I remember at one point when I was briefly rapping, and by briefly, what? probably six years. We'll, we'll talk about a different day. Um, and I, I remember, I, I remember, um, I, I I was like just in this in the in the crib, just mix, messing around, and my friend was sitting there observing me, like do my thing, and I did this like freestyle, and she was just like, "That's that's pretty tight." And we get to doing a second thing, and I was like, "Yo, I just want you to say this when I say this," and it's just like that sort of it's not the the back and forth, but it's almost like that part yeah. and. Um, what was it the 50 cent song and it's like uh like um he's like he says chill yeah yo i got this oh yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you need some help chill here yo i got this i got this it's great <laughs> and it just it's just like it's just something that's i don't know it's just something that you you connect and you're like oh they're just messing around in the studio and they're putting together this heat right. versus this sort of formula i don't know it's just something about it no, um i don't know yeah. yeah, you don't plan it. It's just energy. And that's what I think, going back to your question about what is that secret trait that most, if not all, creative share, it's just they know what works. Like it, and it can be like the most off the wall reference or thing that happens. And it's just like, oh, no, I can use that. I feel like every creator walks through life on a daily basis thinking about, you know, each interaction that they have, they have like this note section where it's like, that just happened. Oh, mm-hmm. I can use that for a script. Oh, you said that? That'll be a dope di- dialogue line in the script. Oh, that's a dope bar. Let me add that. It's just you're always open to creativity, even when it's you always working, even when you're not actively working. I'll, I'll throw this one thing at you before I move to this next question, and it relates to DC. I was uh, down. I was there last week. Last week. Uh, mm-hmm. I was being a good partner. I was buying Jamaican food, and you probably know where I was buying it from. And a rhyme hit me and I wrote down and is, I don't know if it's a triple entendre or what, but I was like my four words, that's so four words of how to move forward. And I said to, <laughs> Oh my God, that's fine. <laughs> I am a nerd. <laughs> but I was like, I gotta write that down. I got my beef patties in my hand. I was like, can't drop these, but I gotta write this down. <laughs> you gotta write that down before you and, forget. Uh, and I, and I sent it to my girl who's an English major. And she's like, you're a nerd. She's like, this is fire. Yeah. You're a nerd. I was like, appreciate you. For sure. For sure. So in this the same vein of where we're we're kind of talking, um, we're we're all very serious about what we do. And we're all very busy. Like, right. um, you know, when folks I'm peeling back a little bit further, that's what we do here. Um when, you know, I do all these interviews and when folks are like, oh, yeah, bro, you know, sorry, man, I've been so busy. 
and then they never reschedule. It's just like, yeah, cool. I'm busier yeah. than you, but fine. But we're all busy. We're all serious about what we do. But when we were younger, the stakes were lower. The stakes were different. So I think it's something about being able to reconnect to play. How do you feel about that idea? And how do you execute that of going back to feeling like something is play, feeling like those those stakes are a bit lower, a bit different, specifically in your creative work? Yeah, so I know for I know professionally we do um I brought this thing at different jobs called Happy Workday. Yeah. Where you uh a staff member picks an activity once a month for the organization to do, and we do it as a group, have fun, and then next month, you know, rent, you know, wash, rinse, repeat, just a different activity. I did it around like three different jobs I've had, but it wasn't my idea. I got it from a colleague of mine back in 2015 and it was just small gestures right it was just something like really small and then i took over and we started doing hot wings challenges and all types of stuff sending people to the you know the er so we don't have to talk about that but that's one way i make work feel like play but also the type of job that i have you know doing programming i have um with reason, a creative license to put an event together. So I can use my creativity to make something work. So while it is routine in the sense that every month I'm doing a different program, it can look different each time. So I don't feel like it's routine and I don't feel um, restricted in, in, in using my creativity to make something work. Um, as far as personally, um, how do I make my work feel like play? or make it fun. I just, I don't know. I, I I just, just going back to the being open for, for different forms of inspiration. When I started, I know we're going to talk about screenwriting um, in a bit, but when I started getting into screenwriting at the time, I only watched two shows, mm -hmm. Martin and Game of Thrones. That was it. Those are wild. <laughs> That's a wide spectrum. Wow. A wild spectrum, right? Bum, 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 bum. <laughs> from the top, from the wall. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm watching Martin, and then after that, I'm going to the Night's nice Watch with my man John. So I'm sitting there, and I'm just like, okay, I need to expand my palette a little bit. And I took this online master class that Shonda Rhimes did, and her very first homework assignment was, you have to know your TV. So right before the pandemic started, I was just like, yeah, I'm just going to watch all of the shows that I feel like I need to watch. And I generated so many different ideas that helped me with my creative projects, just watching these shows, even if it's something that. So now I just pick stuff that I know I'm not trying to write. It goes back to that music conversation of I'm listening to alternative rock to make hip hop. I'm watching psychological thrillers. I'm watching romantic dramas. I'm watching period pieces. I'm watching all types of stuff that I might not necessarily be trying to create. I just want to learn how these writers do it. Mm -hmm. And every day I find something different and that is such a rewarding experience. So that keeps me going. Um, so that's how I make it fun. So it, it doesn't feel like work. I, like the day that it feels like work, I don't know if I want to do it anymore. So I, I want to insert this one thing in there because it, it ties to it. And I and you, you already keyed in on part of the screenwriting and even the, the playwriting side of things. So I definitely want to dive in that fur further. So we'll put a pin in it for a second. Um, it's two things like, you know, I, I wanted to mention this earlier. I, I remember listening to currency. I really like currency. Mm -hmm. And I just remember he was just like, I, I write my, uh, winter wraps in June. Mm. I mean, I like that. <laughs> and yeah. I know, I know personally, you know, uh, audio nerd, radio nerd and all of that stuff. I would not listen to radio here, like in the region. I would listen to California radio. I would listen to K rock all the time. Yes. And it's just a departure to your point. It's like, I'm not trying to do, I'm already this guy from here. Uh, that that thing is gonna, you know, be, like I said, people ask me all the time, where are you from, bro? And as soon as they say me, hear me say two, they're like, oh, you're from Baltimore. And, yeah. you know, but for the most part, sort of the sensibility, the application, how they go about things, that's what I'm interested in. And that rabbit hole, if you will, is in a sense how I discovered some of my early equipment in podcasting. It, it was me listening to Kevin Smith, um, and he had mentioned he was using a Fast Track Pro. And I got to Kevin Smith by listening to K-Rock. I got to K-Rock by listening to the sports junkies in D.C. Yeah. 
that was the through line. That was the connection yeah. point to get get to that. Now, at you know, two thousand nine, when you know I started podcasting and 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 doing this. I don't know if anybody was here that was doing. I don't know if anyone in 92Q was doing it um, to that degree or what have you. It was a, not necessarily gatekeeping. It's just like we're not talking about this. Right. So that market was a bit bigger in a different coast, and I wouldn't discover it if I wasn't like having my ears open. Right, right. Yeah, yeah I, I listened. You know, I started listening to podcasts um, probably around three, four years ago, like on a consistent basis. And like now I listen to podcasts of different shows that I'm watching and I actually go to sleep listening to podcasts. Um, I listen to the Breaking Bad podcast. So every night when I'm dreaming, I'm dreaming about meth and and <laughs> <like Wild>. that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm listening to Heisenberg. So yeah, it's just my mind is just always being creative. I know my therapist tell me I need to like slow down a little bit and just go to sleep in peace, like shut my brain off. But it's just so much information to absorb, and it's fun for me. It, it really is. Now I got another question, another another rapid fire question. I, I I'm going to add. Um, but let's talk a bit about because I got sort of two more real questions. Let's let's okay. talk a bit about um, storytelling a bit more, um, okay. and specifically how you approach. And you you touched on it, but how you approach screenwriting, playwriting, like. How did you get to that stage? Like it became an area of interest, and for you, what makes a good story? Yeah, so it started, it really started my senior year of college when I had wrote the script. I had wrote this script. Uh, every year we did this thing called Sankofa, which highlights the the Black diaspora. Um, and we did it for MLK, uh, MLK Day. You know, our first couple of years on campus, it used to just be talent shows and stuff like that. And, you know, just watching you know, white people playing a harmonica or something crazy. And it's just like, what does this have to do with Martin Luther King? And um, my classmates, they were actually a year um, below me. She was like, we need to come up with Sankofa. And I remember her writing on the board, this is what I plan on doing. So the first year that they did it, it was my 11th grade, um, not my 11th, my junior year of college. I did a poem for them. And then senior year, I ended up writing script for it. And that's when I caught that bug. So when I first graduated from college, I said, yo, I'm writing a TV show. And I remember I had this concept. I'm working on it. And it was too much like Martin. Because, again, that's all I was watching. Um, so I, I put it down and I said, you know what? I'll just live life and then see if something hits me. But I'm not going to try to force it. And um, around 2017, 2018, I, I just started living a certain experience. I was really struggling with my mental health. I was really depressed, but it was a lot of things that was going on in my life that I felt like would have been fire if it was a TV show. But I was like, I'm actually living this. So I just had the idea to write this show. And um, when the pandemic hit, you know, when the shutdown started, I, that was my sign to say, you know what, I'm going to take it seriously and I'm going to go all in um, because my job was uncertain. My job security was uncertain and I just got tired of working for nine to fives and feeling like I had job security. And then when something traumatic happens, it's like, well, actually, you know, we we value you, but not enough to keep you. Mm -hmm. um, so that's when I started taking screenwriting seriously. So I, you know, took the master class, um, started watching a bunch of TV um, and just developing my concept. And uh, in 2022, uh, I paid for a pitch deck for my concept. Um, and in 2023, I paid for another pitch deck for a second concept I was working on. Um, and I just finished that pitch deck. Well, at least I thought I finished it two weeks ago. And then a person who I'm working with to help me with it, he gave me some notes and stuff. So me being a perfectionist, I'm going to go back and work on it. But yeah, that's how I got into it. Um, and what was the second part of your question? Just in, in, in your estimation, what are the elements of a good story? Something that's character driven. You know, we invest in characters, you know. Um, I feel like every story has like a a unique or a, a good story is either unique or is something that is a universal topic that a mass audience can relate to or it's a combination of the two. Mm -hmm. And the biggest thing for me of how I decide which show to watch or to invest in is can I invest in the characters? Can I trust your character? And not in a sense of they have to do the right thing, but if they are, can we curse? Yeah, yeah. If they're a piece of shit, 
<laughs> I need to know why they're a piece of shit. Yeah. And I need to know, I need to trust that their actions is a true reflection of their character. Um, regardless of whether they're a hero, a villain, uh, you know, in, in the middle, it just has to make sense. And I, I'll tell you the story when, you know, I was a sophomore in college and I was writing a creative project. It was like a 50 page story. I had just finished watching Four Brothers, uh, the movie with Mark Wahlberg, Tyrese, Andre. I love that movie. And I was just like, oh, man, I got to have action all over. And I remember writing this story, sending it to my professor. And the first thing my professor, professor said was, this is too plot driven. Mm. And I remember saying, what do you mean by that? And she was like, yeah, everything is just happening for the sake of the plot. Why is your character moving from point A to point B? What's their motivation? Why should I care about their journey? And that was a foreign concept to me at the time, because at the time I was just impressed by the, the action. Yeah. I, I, like, you know, have, and I asked, I said, have you seen Four Brothers? You see how this happens? Crazy. She was like a super plot driven. We need to invest in the characters. Um, and that was something that had really stuck with me. So I take when I come up with a character idea, I do personality tests for mm -hmm. them. Uh, I ask questions from their perspective. I'll even spend a day in their mind. Mm -hmm. And I and I won't even, this is where I say creators are a little bit off. I will go a day or two without speaking to anyone and just imagining myself as this person and really trying to embrace who they are because I can't write you if I don't understand your motivation, if I don't understand, you know, your childhood, if I don't understand your experiences. Yeah. Um, and these are things that will never make it on the page. But if it's really good writing and quality writing, those podcasts that I told you I listened to that analyze those stories and those characters, they'll be able to pick up on it. And yeah. that's what I try to do. That's what I think makes a really good story. That makes sense. That makes sense. And, you know, before I move into this, this, this last real question, I, I think, yeah, even even with some of the things that you you referenced, like you know getting your Heisenberg on, uh, you know uh, you mentioned Jon Snow, you you, you mentioned uh, Martin. Those are the characters that that are there, what have you, and they stick out. It's not like you said, yeah, you know, Sir Jamie, you know, yeah. like, I'm really with him, you know, I'm here with John, or you know, yeah. it's not like you're saying, you know, Aaron Paul's character, or what have you, you know, it's you know, it's sort of sort of the Heisenberg energy. But you know what's crazy? Jamie is one of my favorite characters. We 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 may have to you know <laughs> might have to do a side podcast on hot yeah. D, something like that because look I got thoughts. Jamie is one of my favorites. All I know but, is my guy had a flame sword because I'm a child of the '80s. It's like I got one eye patch, flame sword, <laughs> killing zombies, killing walkers, as it were. That's where we go. Yeah. Uh, lastly, this is sort of the 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 combination, and, and we're we're around it, and we will kind of like you know sort of close out on this real one, this this real question. Looking ahead, what, pie in the sky, manifestation. What's the big dream you're chasing? I want to tell character driven stories on a major platform. Yes, I'm looking at you, HBO. So if you happen to stumble on this, give a brother a call. I'll be sending you my pitch. That. Um, I want to tell these character driven stories, you know, and the, the two concepts that I have are based in DC, yeah. you know, because uh, I want to show a side of DC that has been ignored for so long. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to create something that outlives me. And I don't say that in a morbid sense. I say that as in, I want people to be able to watch what I create and they don't know who I am or care who I am, but that inspires them to do something. My story, I hope, inspires people to say it is possible coming from Southeast D.C. and making a name for yourself for the right reasons. Um, and I want to be able to open the doors for, for a lot of my, my peers and a lot of my friends and colleagues who are talented and creative. I already have this in my mind. You know, again, I don't have control over anything because I don't have a writer's credit, but it's just like once I get my foot in the door every year, I want to bring at least two or three people that I know that's ready for that moment and put them in a position so that they can feed their families and that they can live their dreams. I just want to be the vehicle for people to live their dreams. Um, Nipsey Hussle had a quote. That's actually not his quote. He got it from, I think, Rick Ross or somebody. He said, you measure success. Success is measured by how many people you bless. 
And I truly believe that. And that's how I want to operate. I'm not doing it just for me. It's bigger than me, honestly. And I'm not saying that, again, I don't like cliches, but I really feel like I know a lot of talented people. I know a lot of people that can make a tremendous impact in writing music. And I just want to support them. And I know in order to do that, I have to put myself in a position where I can make an opportunity for myself. And once I do that, I'm going to reach back out. I'm all I'm always DC or nothing. I'm I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I, feel, I feel the same way in Baltimore, but I feel the same way uh, <laughs> you know, in, in doing this is like, you know, I, you know, I'm, I, you know, it's not completely altruistic. Whereas it's like, yeah, I want the credit when someone's just like, yo, so who's doing this thing? Don't don't act like you don't know me. You're right. But, right. Time, you know, it's just like, it, it's, it's not me. I'm very reluctant to, you know, put my, my image, you know, like the image behind me or what have you. I had an artist that I interviewed do this, who, which replaced the previous one that an artist that I interviewed did. It's just me kind of going back. It's not like, hey, let me get on fiber and put together something. It's yeah. like work within that community, showcase, highlight that that work or what have you. Um, and you know, that's why I tell people, leave a review, you know, leave a yeah. rating. It helps the thing get discovered. It's not for me. I'm not sitting here saying, hey, there's 750 episodes of me talking about how great I am. You might right. <laughs> But if I'm you know, helping to facilitate a conversation with someone like you who has an interesting story, who has an interesting approach and it can help get more eyes and ears on what you're doing, that's that's the reward for me. And um, yeah, that's that's really what it is. You know, just trying to be that sort of people's champion kind of guy. Um, right. So that's sort of it for the real questions. Now it's time to get a little get a little off since you said creative. So a little off. Uh, so as I said, you know, as I say to everyone. Don't overthink these. I got five rapid fire questions. I've added two since we've been talking. Okay. Uh, I hope it's a Tony Soprano question in there. But there is not one. There is not one. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna go with the the sort of um easy one and only think of one item here. Okay. What is your Heisenberg fit? Because you know you when he puts the hat on and the glasses, that's just what he's Heisenberg. So what is your Heisenberg fit? When I put on the black Washington Nationals hoodie, <laughs> when I put on the uh, black Washington Nationals hat and a hoodie, with like uh, one of my favorite shows on it, like um, I walk around with this Waystar Royco hoodie that I get a lot of feedback tight. on. That's tight. A, a lot of people stop me in the street and say, I love that show. Or I have like uh, the wire hoodie. So when I have that on with the black nationals hat combination, I feel untouchable. <laughs> I love it. Um, <laughs> if it was, if it was to be one thing, um, what is the hardest part of the artist life? Because it's not just hey, I turn this on, turn this off. It's like nah, I can't can't turn. It's like the Miles Davis thing. It's music always going on in my head. Right. So what's the hardest part of the artist life for you? Uh, forcing yourself to uh, make a living while you try to pursue your creative dreams. You know, so having to work a a nine to five when, you know, it may not be something that you enjoy doing. That's why I do nonprofits, because it is a nine to five, but it's something that I'm it's mission driven work. Yeah. But having to be an adult, do adult things and adult have adult responsibilities while still trying to pursue your dream. That's, that's legit. All right. This one is this one is funny. OK, uh, Martin to Game of Thrones. What job would Tommy have in Game of Thrones? <laughs> <laughs> I thought you'd like that. <laughs> what job would Tommy have in Game of Thrones? <laughs> the notoriously questionably employed Tommy. <laughs> what? I'm, that is a fire question. <laughs> okay, let me think about this real quick. I know you said don't overthink it. What job would Tommy have on Game of Thrones? I ain't gonna hold you. I feel like Tommy might be at the wall. <laughs> <laughs> Tommy might be at the wall. He might end up just, I don't know, feeding uh, Master Aemon because he don't want to do no real work. That's fantastic. <laughs> All right. This is this is uh this is the penultimate sort of rapid fire question. This one goes um, it's very simple. I, okay. I, I referenced this earlier. Flats or drums? Drums. So you get it. This is this is why we're boys. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. said flat. I'm like, y'all got to delete this interview. This is <laughs> done. We're out of here. 
uh, you know, is, I don't understand the flat obsession, you know, but can't, do can't it. Drums can't it. I mean, drums, black people like percussion. Um, it just, <laughs> it just works. <laughs> it, it, uh, it works. All right. So this is the last one. This one has a little bit more thought to it, but because you're a DC culture guy, you'll be able to answer this. And we're looking for that sort of that next level, not the typical, hey, you go here, you get the, you know, mascot president thing. So you're being a tour guide for someone in a scenario and they're visiting DC for a long weekend, three days. Um, they want the authentic experience. Tell me three things that you got to do. Mm. That you would do, like you're not saying, oh, well, you may got to do. You're like, no, I do this. You'll probably see me here, bro. <laughs> That's a really, really good one. Um, wow, three things. The first thing I would do, I would take, I would take somebody, I would take somebody to a real curry out with real mumbo sauce. I know like a lot of restaurants, they have mumbo sauce on the menu and I avoid that every time because it's not legit. Um, and then like the Chinese restaurants that used to be in like Chinatown, yeah. um, I don't know if they still there, wasn't that good. You got to go into the hole in the wall joints, the ones that probably failed health inspection. Um, so I take, I take them there and I actually took a friend there and put them on a the mumbo sauce and they loved it. Uh, what's the second thing I do? Definitely, I'll probably do a sh I, I love shows, so I'll probably do a show at probably like the Howard Theater, mm. um, which is funny, quick, funny story. I went to the Howard Theater last week and people were fighting and I was like, yes. <laughs> As one, ooh, yeah, this is the other show. <laughs> I was like, yes, I, I low key live for ghetto shit as long as nobody gets stabbed or shot. Um, stick the jab, stick the jab. <laughs> So I probably would take them to a show um, at the Howard Theater. And what's the third thing? I'll probably, I'll probably connect them with somebody that's doing um, work in the humanities and they can learn about the culture or the neighborhood that they're working on. Um, we got a lot of people. I, I've been meeting a lot of people that um, have been telling oral histories and stories of different neighborhoods. And I always thought it was really cool because it's like people come to a neighborhood and it's gentrified. Yeah. So it's like you don't get the the true rich history behind that neighborhood or they may have a negative uh, reputation for for whatever reason. But it's really um history and significance behind that. So I probably would connect them with one of my colleagues to learn more about the, the neighborhood that they're in. No, you it's know, U Street, Black Broadway, yeah. what is, you know, um, Berry Farms, you know, the Anacostia, you know, places like that. So that's rich. It's um, and, and I think that's important. Like, again, you know, it's, it's the hive mind thing here. You know, it's just like you don't get some culture. You don't get some food. You don't see some stuff. I'm into you don't see the show. I'm trying to go to the show. You pay him. I'm trying to go to the show. So, yeah, yeah that's kind of what that is. Um, yeah, I probably do that. And I and I did some of that, you know, when I have friends visit, you know, I, I'll do some of that. Yeah, I mean, when you, I got this reputation, I have, um, you know, my partner's uh, nephews, they, they live in D.C., and they look at me as the culture guy. And it's like, yo, so where are we going? And it's not even just like Baltimore. It's like, yo, where are we going to D.C.? I was like, I don't live down there. Where are we right. going to Philly? I don't live up there. <laughs> it's like, but you know, like 10 places. I was like, this is true. And it just speaks to one, trust, but also it speaks to right. like having exquisite taste. And this is where you and I intersect, bro. Right, right. Two things I want to do as we wrap up here. One, I want to thank you for for coming on to the podcast and you know chopping it out with me. This is a good way to wrap up an afternoon. And um, and two, I want to invite and encourage you to share with the listeners where they can check you out, check out your work, um, and the website, social media, all of that good stuff. The floor is yours. Yeah, uh, thanks for this opportunity, man. I, I I wouldn't miss it for the world. Um, you can find me on Twitter or X. Um, and Instagram, um, Jimmy Watts Music. So that's two T's, W-A-T-T-S, music. Um, what else? My work, you can look up. Uh, well, you're going to put the Queen Bees link in there. Yeah, yeah. yeah so uh, check out, if you can, uh, a couple of videos uh, from Queen Bees. That's B-E-E-Z. Um, don't copyright me, Beyonce. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I love you. Um <laughs> You can check out Lifeguard, uh, Home Run, 
Shades, Monster. We have a plethora of videos. Um, but yeah, you can really find me on Instagram and Twitter, Jimmy Watts Music. And um, hopefully, hopefully this isn't the last time we connect. And hopefully I can come back with some more updates. <laughs> I love that. And there you have it, folks. I want to again thank James, Jimmy, James Watkins for coming on to the podcast. And I'm Rob Lee saying that there's art, culture, and community in and around your neck of the woods. You've just got to look for it. Oh,